Welcome everyone to the October 25th webinar for the 2DCCC. Um, thank you for, for showing up today. Sorry, that was one more C that I needed. Um, Josh Robinson will be giving a talk today on uh, advanced characterization techniques. I just want to let you know that this session is being recorded. Um, I will moderate the session. At the end of the session, we will have the online folks ask questions first, but you may chat your questions during out the session in the chat box, and I will monitor them for you and add them at the end of the session. So without further ado, Joshua Robinson. Thanks, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, so I think one of the things that we're going to do today is really look at a broader overview of uh, looking at characterization techniques for 2D materials. Now, there's a, there's a, a wide range of characterization techniques, so I'm just focusing on a few that might not be used um, that uh, quite as much as others, but then also some that um, are used uh, to very great effect um, in helping us understand the properties of these 2D materials. So, the very first is, and, and some of you have seen this before, is there's lots of ways to grow these materials, right? So there's, there's the uh, <coughs> powder vaporization process, which is in the bottom right. Uh, the chemical vapor transport process, which is in the top right, uh, metal transformation, uh, as well as chemical vapor deposition and a variety of, of other uh, techniques. The real key is, is uh, once we grow it, we need to look at it. Um, we need to understand its properties. And there's a whole zoo of different techniques that we could potentially pick from. So this is um, an old chart from Evans Analytical uh, that I like to show uh, basically on the y-axis we have the, the detection range down into the parts per trillion um, and on the x-axis we have the analytical spot size so this is the spot size for, for you know z or xy uh, uh, resolution and you can see that um, Raman uh, you know kind of falls in the middle uh, then there's things like Toff Sims, Dynamic Sims, etc that can get us to really, really um, uh, uh, excellent sensitivities, uh, but their spot size is somewhat large. On the other end, um, you can get things like transmission electron microscopy, which is this green bar across the top <coughs> that uh, can get us to very high resolution um, in terms of, of individual atoms, uh, but its chemical sensitivity isn't quite as good. Uh, so the next slide kind of shows uh, where we are in terms of the the depth, right? So 2D materials are all surface materials. So in this particular case, we're very interested in um, <coughs> materials that can can help us understand the surface. Uh, and it might be a little hard to see for our audience here, but things like AFM, top sims, uh, these are extremely surface sensitive techniques. Um, uh, Whereas you go a little bit farther into things like XPS, SEM, and they, they, they get into the, the 10 nanometer range or near surface um, techniques, all the way down through um, some bulk uh, techniques such as X-ray diffraction. Now TEM is, in this chart is considered uh, on the far right as a bulk technique. Uh, it actually isn't. Um, if you want to get to high resolution, uh, you need to on the order of 20 nanometers to 50 nanometer thick samples um, or thinner. Uh, in order to be actually be able to get that that atomic resolution, so so like I said, we first we grow it, and then we look at it. Your traditional ways of just quickly looking at these materials uh, involve uh, optical microscopy, atomic force microscopy, scanning electron microscopy. Those are normally the first things you do to see if you've just made a bunch of junk on the surface, um, or if you've got something that's worth pursuing a little bit further. <clears throat> in that case, you go to things like Raman spectroscopy and photoluminescence. Um, and almost, I think the majority of, of um, publications that we see have these techniques in them um, just as a, a first, first uh, line of, of attack on the uh, uh, looking at and understanding the 2D materials. And with, within the, uh, the optical microscopy, or the, the, the various microscopies I've got here, primarily is a morpho morphological um, uh, quick view. Um, Raman spectroscopy can tell us a bit more about our 2D materials, though. <coughs> In general, what we have um, are various uh, um, aspects of Raman. Uh, there are the characteristic Raman frequencies, uh, 
This typically is indicative of the composition of your material. So, for instance, looking at the difference between molydisulfide, tungsten diselenide, uh, molyoxide. The other is a, the next is a change in the, in the Raman frequency. As it shifts back and forth, this can mean a lot in terms of stress and strain. We can also see um, uh, uh, things like um, a doping um, effects. Polarization of the material can give us um, an indication of the crystal symmetry and the orientation of your, your material systems. And then, of course, the width of the Raman peak uh, is all related uh, to the crystal quality. So you can get things like the, the more defective your material is, the broader that, that Raman peak is. Uh, and then, of course, the last one is intensity of the Raman peak. Quite often it is uh, related to the amount of material on there, but it also is, is strongly related to um, the, uh, the phonon coupling efficiency um, that we can actually get out. So we can get a lot of things from Raman um, that can quickly give us an identification of what the properties of the material are and whether it's not, whether it's worth moving forward um, with, the, uh, with the characterization. <coughs> but if we want to actually get to things that looking at the atomic scale and the atomic arrangement of these 2D materials, we need to go more sophisticated. And one of the most heavily used tools for really understanding the atomic arrangement of these 2D materials is, is TEM. Uh, as transmission electron microscopy. So this is on the left. Um, again, a lot of folks are in this field are quite familiar with these, this technique. Um, and uh, just using a <coughs> electron source, electron beams, uh, the condenser lenses are quite, are often magnetic. Um, and then what they do is they hit the, the sample and it gets projected down onto a viewing screen, CCD, etc. Below that you can do things like eels, um, uh, electron energy loss, spectroscopy, you can also do EDS, um, energy dispersive spectroscopy, in the sample as well. What I'm showing on the right here is a publication of Professor Alems um, here at Penn State looking at defects in these 2D materials. And this is specifically tungsten sulfide, I believe, uh, where she was able to, on the top row, um, A through D, image the atomic arrangement of the, the atoms and then model it um, below that. And what we would, and, and you can very uh, uh, quickly see the different uh, arrangements of those atoms. So this helps us uh, to start thinking about using things like TEM or these atomic scale techniques to build structure models of our 2D materials that we might not necessarily uh, have experimental verification of. And this um, <clears throat> this can also come from the trying to understand what the, the true atomic transformations are in these 2D materials. So I mentioned there's a bunch of different ways to grow these materials, right? The, the, the most popular, the top left here, powder vaporization. You basically put a couple of powders in a furnace, you heat them up, they vaporize, they flow downstream, and they redeposit on the surface of the, the sample. Or you can have your sample directly above the powders, a couple of different configurations you can do. Typically what we find in the literature is the, the, what you see on the top right, uh, where most people are showing uh, these various 2D layers with different um, uh, form factors. They can be hexagons, pentagons, et cetera, um, uh, triangles. However, uh, that's not the whole story. Most often what happens is you end up getting this range um, of fins actually forming uh, that stick straight out of the surface all the way to what most people look at as this 2D material on the right, um, your, your traditional 2D, 2D system. And uh, the fin orientation uh, actually turns out to be the deposition of molybdenum oxide first and then a transformation into to, uh, molybdenum disulfide. And again, um, that they, they remain in fin form at this far, at the really close end of the precursor. So TEM was able to help us understand this atomic transformation. So what we did to better understand, again, the, you know, what is really going on here is we simply vaporized molybdenum oxide and we were able to grow these fins. You can see in the top left there's an SEM and TEM directly below it and to the right of it showing that uh, the atomic arrangement you can do things like selected area diffraction or nanobeam diffraction in these systems and get the arrangement. You can use EDS to verify what the nominal chemistry is of these, these systems. And we were able to verify that, in fact, with going from a molyoxide, uh, MOO3 uh, vaporization, uh, 
that reduces to a moly dioxide, sorry, moly trioxide to a moly dioxide, and it grows on the surface. And the energy, the, the minimum energy that is required for growth, force these to grow vertically instead of laterally uh, in this, this regime. So these fins then, you can anneal them in sulfur. So when we do that, we can then partially anneal it in sulfur and look at it in TEM. And you're able to see that <clears throat> with this second uh, image that just popped up, there's actually sulfurization that is occurring from the base up, not from the top down. And uh, the little inset, as a matter of fact, is showing that there's MOS2 that is growing vertically up the sides of this MOO2. And the reason is because on the outside edge of this, the whole outside of this MOO2 fin gets passivated by an MOS2 layer. And the sulfur has to, has to be able to come in and migrate through a particular um, uh, route. And that happens to be at this interface between the substrate and the, the fin, where you actually have Van der Waal gaps, et cetera, that are exposed. And now sulfur has a very high um, uh, probability of fusing up through these layers, and we get this transformation of MOO2 to MOS2. And if you continue the sulfurization, you can get these beautiful MOS2 fins that are vertically forming out of the surface. So using TEM, um, we're able to, to start thinking about mechanistic ways of the phase transformations, um, and we're able to propose different regimes for these TMD growths from metal organic, uh, sorry, from metal oxide uh, type um, materials. So the other is then when you're growing these materials via chemical vapor transport, MOCVD, et cetera, and we don't fully know what the true structure is of the system. In this case, it happened to be tungsten ditelluride. Uh, there was some hypothesis that tungsten ditelluride would be, we'd be able to stabilize it in a 2H form. Um, we could not stabilize it in a 2H form. Uh, and uh, we work with some very clever folks at UT Dallas to, to do high resolution TEM um, on these systems in different orientations of the crystal itself. So it's showing here um, uh, from left to right are the various orientations, the zone axis, of looking at tungsten ditelluride and then modeling the um, position of the atoms. This was simulated with X, X, HREM software. Um, and we were able to pull out then what the true structure was. And it turned out that it's a, a distorted 1T structure of this um, tungsten ditelluride phase. Um, and and that, that turns out to be uh, the most stable phase um, in this material. We wanted it to be semiconducting. It didn't happen to be semiconducting. It turned out that it was, was uh, semi-metallic. Um, however, by doing the TEM and being able to model what the structure is, we can then start thinking about making true physical structures from these models and from the TEM. And from that, we can start um, uh, ensuring that we have accurate uh, electronic structures of these materials. So in this particular case, again, knowing exactly where the atoms are, et cetera, um, physically uh, and experimentally verifying where they are led to a way to ensure that we have the proper, proper um, DFT. And again, it verifies that there is some crossing of the conduction band into the, 
to the uh, across the Fermi level, and we have a semi-metal in this particular case. So, <clears throat> so moving on from structure when we're growing these materials, which is again the focus of of 2DCC is how do you grow these materials on large scale? We really have to think about impurities in the system. So um, again, you can think about Raman, you can think about PL, some various simple, um, you know, more straightforward um, types of techniques. Um, and in theory, when we're growing something like tungsten diselenide, um, we start off with tungsten hexacarbonyl and either dimethyl selenium or hydrogen selenide. Right? And then in theory, we should form you know, these various, uh, various reactants um, or, or products here at the end, one including tungsten diselenide. In reality, what we have is our precursor plus something. Right? It's not 100% pure. Um, and the question is, is well, what is that? Uh, and <clears throat> if you look at growing um, tungsten diselenide with these different precursors, now again, we're just changing the selenium precursor in this case, you can see um, drastic differences in the morphology. Dimethyl selenium shows there's just tons of particles everywhere, right? And in the case of hydrogen selenide, it's much cleaner. There are some particles, but it, it's pretty obvious that, that there's, there's a, a drastic um, difference in this particular case. Now you can look at Raman spectroscopy as, again, a quick, hey, what's going on here? Um, and in fact, you see um, just below 300, the large peak there, that's a tungsten selenide peak. And the black is the hydrogen selenide growth, and the, and the red is the dimethyl selenium growth. And you zoom in on the red, and it turns out that we've got a nice D and G peak there, right? So we're depositing carbon, you know, and actually some, some reasonably um, defective graphene, if you will, <laughs> on, the, on the surface here. So in our particular case, Raman was able to tell us, okay, we're getting carbon contamination in these layers, right? And, and that's obviously a problem. Um, however, Raman, XPS, these various materials, the, the various um, uh, other characterization techniques, typically require on the order of percent level impurities uh, to be able to be identified using your more traditional um, uh, characterization techniques. And a lot of times you can get you know, up to a percent or something like that and not even really see it in, in um, using things like Rama and PL, et cetera. So you have to think about, again, more sophisticated, more advanced ways to really identify what is going on in your material uh, because we know we're at least depositing carbon, but what else are we depositing? So in this particular case, one technique is, is inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy. This is actually laser ablation, the way this... Uh, this uh, uh, schematic is shown here. So <clears throat> start off, we put our sample, that's in the bottom left of this schematic, um, and we ablate the surface with a laser. And that, uh, that ablated surface, um, then it gets pushed uh, with a gas up into a plasma. This is directly below the MS and the ICP MS for those online. Uh, and there's a nice picture of it in the bottom uh, there with the arrow coming out. That basically breaks apart all of the, uh, the ablated material from the laser, forms ions, that gets brought into a quadrupole mass spectrometer, and everything gets separated by mass. Right? And from that, we're able to then identify what um, some of the original materials were, the original elements, et cetera, that were coming from our film um, after we've grown it. So let's do that with, with uh, our tungsten diselenide. So in this particular case, we took a tungsten diselenide that was grown with dimethyl selenium. We stuck it in this ARICP mass spec uh, with the, uh, the, the work of uh, um, collaboration with the Wallace Group at UT Dallas. And what you find is there's about 40 different elements that show up in this material, right? In, in addition to tungsten and selenium and carbon. So those aren't even listed on here, right? Um, and okay, you know, impurity levels, these are in the parts per million here, you know, so this is a log scale, so it can go up to 100 parts per million and even above in some of these, but others are, are you know, tens parts per million. It might not sound that much, um, but if you think about this in terms of doping levels in semiconductors, so these are on the order of 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 19 um, and doping in silicon, right? So if you want to dope something N-type, or P-type, you normally start at 10 to the 15 and, uh, and then go up, right? 
So in this particular case, this indicates to us that the way we're growing these materials and whatever it is that we've got in our precursor or the system, et cetera, is really causing a high level of impurities well beyond what we would ever be able to detect with Raman or anything else. So we said, okay, well, we obviously got to clean up our act, right? So um, the dimethyl selenium has, you know, even though it claims it, 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 proudly that it's 99.99% it's pure, well, there's a whole bunch of that. That 0.01% is the rest of this stuff here in these bars, right? So it's a lot of stuff, even if you can't see it so well. Um, you move to hydrogen selenide. Again, the hydrogen selenide actually is not quite as pure as it should be. But it, I think it's about 99.5% um, in, in this particular case. So there's still 0.5% impurities in this, in this hydrogen selenide. But we're able to knock out 35 of the element, impure, elemental impurities, simply by going from a metal organic to a pure gas um, type system. So uh, we would have never known this, though, if it wouldn't be for the, the, the use of ICP mass spec and really to understand the, the impurity levels in our systems. Um, so it can be an, actually a very powerful tool uh, so that we can better understand um, the, uh, the, the method or the, the impurities in these systems. The other process that actually takes the sensitivity or similar sensitivities, I should say, to things like ICP mass spec, but then adds atomic or, or nanoscale resolution on the surface is top sims time of flight, secondary IMS spectroscopy. So this is something we've got here at Penn State in Materials Characterization Lab. Um, we've got some fantastic uh, folks to run it, but essentially what happens, um, as shown here on the, uh, on the left, is we've got a cesium gun, or very, there's various different types of guns that you can use, argon gun, for sputtering off the surface very gently. And as that gets sputtered off, what happens um, is that it comes up through a uh, separator um, and then it gets uh, detected at the, the ion detector. And the, I'm showing in the bottom right here this little Evans analytical chart. It's the, uh, this big red bubble there that the, uh, the yellow arrow is pushed into. So it can go to very high sensitivities and very small um, uh, uh, spot size. <coughs> It's quite useful for mapping chemical residue for things like transferred graphene or transferred 2D materials. Right? So in this particular case, this is an example from the literature um, out of UT Austin uh, that looked specifically at transferring graphene, CBD graphene, onto other substrates, onto BN, onto SiO2, et cetera. And what they were able to do after a lot of calibration, so I have to give the caveat with top sims is it's, it's, it's very highly uh, sensitive to elements, ions, but it's also, uh, and it's also um, uh, very sensitive in the Z. However, uh, it takes a lot of work to do the proper calibration. So these folks took, a, a, um, the, the Ruoff group took about a year and a half focusing on understanding the residue from a polymer transfer of graphene. Uh, and in the particular case, they're showing here this, this beautiful map of, of the different types of residue that can occur on the surface of graphene um, a, as a result of the, the uh, transfer process. And you'll see there's very, on the right side, there's OH groups and CL groups. These are it's adventitious material. The only one that is related to a graphene is actually the C3 minus, which is the top left here. Everything else is related to some kind of junk or SiO2, right? Uh, so, and this is with atomic resolution um, in these. And the uh, scale bar here is one micron. Um, so you can see that it actually has nice resolution similar to an SEM. <clears throat> you can also use this, and this is something we did here at, at Penn State, of looking at dopants in 2D materials. So you want to dope these 2D materials. You want to find what, uh, where these dopants are in the 2D materials. Now, in this particular case, what we had was uh, trying to dope MOS2 with manganese. And XPS uh, told us that no matter how much manganese we tried to put in there on these materials, we could never find it. It was never there. Um, and uh, in fact, it was there. It just turned out that the doping that we were doing was more functionalizing the SO2 surface than the MOS2 itself. So that's why we weren't seeing it in the MOS2. And even then, which is where you can actually see these small pixels um, on the right side of the manganese elemental map, 
uh, they are spread everywhere, right? So it, clearly there's a competition between it. But it was Toph Sims that gave us the answer to where's our manganese going, and it turned out that the manganese is going and reacting with our SiO2 rather than our MOS2. Now you can think about other things like <coughs> doping MOS2 with tungsten, right, up to the point where you're actually alloying and the percent levels and those kind of things. That's much easier, but manganese sulfide is a 3D material, where molysulfide is a 2D material. So there is this competition between maintaining layered formations and, and going to 3D formations. Um, and, and we think that also played a role in, in our ability to get a lot of manganese in there. But Top Sims was able to map out exactly where the manganese was in these particular systems. Again, providing us with a means to, in this case, not necessarily identify an impurity, but identify where our dopants are going um, in these material systems. So the, the other thing that we have to think about with, with TOF sims um, that's quite interesting um, is that you can do depth profiles with these. Now if you look at the, the right chart, uh, the right graph first, what you see is, is the depth in nanometers here. Now this again takes calibration to be able to do, but their depth profile was on the order of up to three nanometers um, in, in the depth. What they did was they put graphene on top of boron nitride and then did a depth profile down through the graphene into the boron nitride. And what the claim, um, using these various ions, which are identified on the right, um, they were able to identify which ions match to which material system. And then they were able to show that, in fact, you can get a graphene layer. Now we're looking at the right or the left side. Graphene layer, which is identified in blue. There's an interface layer, which is basically junk. It's, car it's, it's copper. Um, residue left behind from the copper etching process uh, and, and copper oxides uh, and then we get into the boron nitride so you know this when when properly done you can you can get true sub nanometer um, uh, resolution in with in, in terms of the chemical analysis um, using using top sims the problem with it is when you get into things like surface roughness. Um, so basically, you just want to kind of look at the bottom here, <coughs> where region we've got region or region A and B on the bottom left, and then we've got this interface, right? If it turns out that that's truly the region, it'll actually suggest that there's true intermixing as opposed to just surface roughness. Uh, it's, it's very hard to be able to tell the difference between those. Uh, so that's that's something to take into consideration um, after or as as a part of the analysis process. Uh, but if you do it right, you can actually get a lot of really, really neat information from that. So I think one of the last things I really wanted to talk about um, was uh, atomic scale electronic properties. Uh, and this is with STM, um, STS. It was a 1986 Nobel Prize uh, where you take the STM tip, uh, take a metal tip that's atomically sharp. So these are individual atoms in the red. We have our, our sample at the bottom, uh, which is, is green here, and you put a voltage across them. Obviously, if you have a, it put a voltage across them, it's going to use current to monitor the distance between them, right? So these, the red and the green here need to both be conducting, um, at least conducting enough so that you don't crash your tip into the, into the surface. But when you do that, you can actually get um, quite nice atomic resolution um, in, in a variety of the uh, the, the TMDs. Um, one of the ways that we are typically doing this now is uh, growing our TMDs, our 2D materials, on top of graphene. Um, you can do it also on top of graphite um, or other, other metallic surfaces um, such that you're able to get a high enough conductivity so that you can do STM and STS on the, on the materials. And now typically, oh that came out wrong, typically what you'll find is you can do an IV curve in the top top left there, um, of the, uh, at any individual point on the surface. So as you're going along, and as your, your tip's going along and moving along, <coughs> you can do a uh, current voltage curve at any one of these, these atomic positions. And, and uh, what you'll find is that you get these little kinks in the, in the IV curve. If you take the derivative of that, what you find then is, is what's shown just below here, um, and that's related to the density of states in your material. So the, uh, the, the, the number of, of regions or the, the number of spots available for electrons to, uh, to, to fill. And you can see then um, at typically at zero volts is, is where the Fermi level falls. Um, and 
these different curves where you see these spikes in the DIDV, that means that there's a high number of, of density states are, uh, in, in the material. Um, using that, uh, what we can do then is look at things like what the band gap of materials are. Right? So the density of states, zero density of states is where a gap is, an electronic gap in your material system. And the example that I'm showing here on the left at the top are, are semiconducting nanotubes versus metallic nanotubes. Um, and in the case, he, the, in the top left, what you see uh, typically is that you will find a region um, where you will get to the DIDV will go to zero. Um, and when it goes to zero, or you know, nominally as close to zero as you can, what you'll find then is that that's where the band gap is. And then it comes back up. And you can measure the band gap. And in this particular case, there are different size nanotubes, which we know the band gap changes as a function of diameter. On the bottom, though, is different chirality of the nanotubes are metallic, right? Um, and in this particular case, they never actually go to zero um, in with uh, the uh, uh, for for metallic nanotubes. And that's shown in that little schematic right beside it, right above the uh, metallic nanotube um, uh, <coughs> plot there. The interesting thing is when you're measuring the band gap of TMDs. So this is where STM, STS uh, comes in to, you know, when I first was thinking about this. Um, you know, quite often, when one measures the, or reports a band gap of a MOS2 or a tungsten diselenide, et cetera, they use photoluminescence to measure that band gap. Uh, and that's not correct to use photoluminescence to measure the band gap of these TMDs. And I'll tell you in a minute, the first is if you, so here's one example. Um, this is MOSE2 on top of bilayer graphene that's grown on, on uh, silicon carbide. So you do the room temperature measurement in black, the low temperature measurement in, in green there on the bottom left, and you see that the band gap or the, the PL peak changes. So we would think that, okay, photoluminescence, that's related directly to the band gap. Um, we would have a band gap on the order of about 1.6 EV or so in this particular case. And in fact, when you do STS, so you're, you, you look and you do this DIDV versus, versus voltage, um, what you find, in fact, is in STS that it's a band gap of about 2.15, 2.2 EV. So the question then is, okay, why is there a big difference between these two? And, you know, variety of folks probably know, um, but it comes down to exciton binding. So excitons, uh, you know, it's a pair, uh, it's an it's a electron hole pair that is physically separated but electronically coupled, um, uh, in, or uh, <coughs> energetically coupled um, to each other. And that's shown in the, the band diagram um, here, uh, where we have our conduction band in the black, and we have our valence band um, uh, in the, uh, the red and then blue. And quite often what happens is these excitons in transition metal dichalcogenides have a very high binding energy. And they dominate ultimately what the, the optical properties of your TMDs. So when you're doing PL in these systems, what you ultimately are actually measuring is what we would refer to as an optical band gap versus what the true band gap is in, in STS. Um, and then when you compare the two, you can find out what that binding energy is of the 2D material, or of the exciton in these, the, the 2D material. Now, typical excitons in, in standard semiconductors are on the order of, you know, a few milli electron volts, right? Up the words of, you know, all the way up to maybe 100 in some of these, these uh, ones on the top right here uh, in the, <clears throat> however, in the case of these 2D materials, 2D TMDs, they're anywhere between five and a hundred times greater than what you would think uh, find in traditional semiconductors. So a hundred times, right, we're on the order of half an EV, you know, a third to a half of an EV in terms of the binding energy of these, these 2D materials now, or the binding energy of excitons in the 2D materials. And what that leads to then is a massive difference uh, between what you think you have as a binding or uh, as a, a band gap optically and what the true band gap is um, in, the, uh, in the material. The other thing is that um, excitons are not point, um, you know, they're not a single atom or anything like that. They actually can span several nanometers in size. So this is just the wave function of an exciton. So where, you know, these, the, uh, the electron hole uh, 
uh, pair circling each other. Um, so they can go over uh, quite a long, long range um, in, these, uh, in these material systems. So XPS, or sorry, STS, STM provide us with a means to really understand what the local band gap of the materials are and what the true band gap is and what the doping is, because quite often what you'll find in these STS is that it shifts back and forth where zero is the Fermi level. So this is an n type material in this particular case, right? Uh, and uh, so you can get a lot of, uh, of electronic uh, properties or understand a lot of electronic properties at the atomic scale using, using these materials, uh, this, this characterization technique. And you can use a variety of these techniques to then understand some more complex material systems. So like I just mentioned, photoluminescence doesn't always tell us what the true band gap is of the material systems, but they can tell us when there's, there's hybridization um, of the uh, uh, various materials. So in this particular case, I'm showing an example of MOS2 on top of MOSE2, that's the top right, and that's the one that we'll pretty much talk about um, on this slide. If you look at um, B here on the bottom, bottom left, the various uh, different signatures, what you find is you can get, when you grow these on top of each other, you can get their individual photoluminescence peaks, but then you can also get an extra photoluminescent peak. Uh, and that typically falls at a lower energy, so that's the 1.59 EV um, on the top B, and then just below it is 1.36 EV, and you can see that because of the noise there, you can tell that they're, they're different efficiencies, but what that means is that these are type two band um, alignments where the conduct charge carriers from the conduction band in one of the layers drops down into the valence band of the other layer. So even though they're physically separated, the charge carriers can recombine across the layers um, in that case. And you can use STM, STS to understand what the coupling is as well. Um, and that we'll look at D and E in this particular case. You can see in, in D here, um, it's 60 by 100 nanometers or so in terms of the scale. And you get these very large Moria. <laughs> So, um, <clears throat> doing the 60 by 100 nanometer scan that's shown in D here, you can see there's, there's a, a Moray pattern. That Moray pattern tells us a lot about the orientation between the layers. Uh, and based on stacking um, the theoretical layers on top of each other and then rotating them, which is in E on the bottom here, what you find is that you can match actually pretty closely what the separation is, or what that, the distance of that moray pattern. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that it's about a two degree um, uh, mismatch between MOS2 and WSE2. You can then take that same sample and do scanning tunneling spectroscopy on it. Uh, and that's what's shown here, and it's schematically in the top right. So you take an STM tip, you can put it right on the graphene, you put it on the WSE2 and then you on graphene, and then in the red you can put it on all three layers, the tri-layers. What you find is in the blue, which is in the bottom right here in G, the inset graphene, it shows that there's no band gap, right? So this again is DIDV, so density of states never really goes to zero. However, in the case of uh, the tungsten selenide on graphene, which is in the green, See, it shows a band gap of about 1.9 EV um, in this particular case, which again is much larger than what optically you would see, which is about 1.6 EV uh, or 6.5 EV. <coughs> and, but then when you take that same tip 
and you put it on the tri-layer, the MOS2 on WSC2 on graphene, the band gap actually shrinks. It goes from 1.9 eV to about 1.7 eV. All right, so now we've taken this material that has a band gap of, of 1.9 eV. We've taken another material, which is MOS2, that has a larger band gap than WSE2, stick it on top, and the hybridization of those two actually shrink the band gap. So again, what it's telling us is that there is some form of hybridization that is occurring, or crosstalk, whatever you will, um, between these materials that make that stack actually a smaller band gap system than what it would be if you'd had the individual layers by themselves. So again, STS is a very powerful way, STM-STS is a very powerful way for us to, to understand the electronic properties and understand uh, density of states uh, spatially on the atomic scale. Um, and then on top of it, um, if you were to go in and look at these individual uh, more patterns that are shown here in D, the bright and dark spots, those too can have different um, uh, electronic states in them. So better understanding that and better understanding the hybridization using these materials, th this uh, characterization technique um, can, uh, can be quite powerful. All right, so my summary slide. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, I've gone over just, again, at a very high level, um, a variety of characterization techniques uh, to try to introduce you to some, hopefully, a couple of characterization techniques you didn't really think about for 2D materials. You know, Raman, a lot of people use Raman. It's really, really useful. PL, again, very useful. They're very, very straightforward in the sense of, of rapid characterization. Uh, but then there's things like um, TEM, ICP mass spec, TOF SIMS, STM, STS, that could really lead us um, to better understanding these materials um, with ultra, ultra sensitivity chemically as well as, as spatially. Um, so, you know, hopefully, um, you know, the, uh, I've convinced you that these are wonderful uh, instruments. And um, I'd encourage you to take a look at uh, mip.psu.edu to better understand some of these other systems, as well as MCL, uh, the Materials Characterization Lab here at, at Penn State. Um, and we're constantly looking for um, you know, new materials to, to explore and characterize. And with that, I'll take questions. That's it. Okay. First, uh, moderate some questions online. Josh, we had one that came in earlier from Raphael. He was asking, where do you buy H2SE? Where do you buy hydrogen selenide? Um, commercially. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Matheson Gas will, will sell it. Um, so it's an ex you can't just buy it. Um, you have to make sure, you know, and again, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to go run out and buy it. Um, because there's there's a lot of safety that goes in around it. It's a very deadly gas. Um, it took us a couple years to get the safety um, put in our uh, our our um, facility to be able to do that. However, once you have it, it's a great great system to use. Does TOF Sims give oxidation state of the constituent atoms? Resolution of TOF Sims at P PSU and is at a user facility. Okay, so the resolution of the top sims is on the order of about 50 nanometers or so. 75. So, okay, 75 nanometers. Um, and yes, it's at Penn State as part of the user facility. Um, and um, the oxidation states of the constituent atoms, I don't believe that it's going to really show that. Yeah, so. Um, you have plans to add ion or low energy electron diffraction to study monolayer strain, mosaic, epi, etc. Uh, so low energy electron diffraction, I don't think that we're going to have that in the MBE system, but we will have ARPES, we will have READ, I, I don't know that we have LEAD. Although we do have faculty at Penn State that does, uh, that, that focuses on LEAD. Um, so that, that's something that could be done ex situ, but not in situ. Any questions here while they're typing? Any questions from the local audience, please? Yeah, so these are the, the ST, sorry, the, the question is um, for the STS measurements, are there um, any special things that we do for the surface to protect it um, for the actual measurements themselves, right? 
We did not do any particularly special things to prep the samples other than just seal them in a nitrogen you know, environment and uh, but prior to the introduction into the STM STS system. The, the STM itself was done in UHV. Uh, so it's a, it's a clean surface in the sense that when they put it in to the system, they heat it to about 400 C or so to desorb any kind of adsorbates, uh, and then they, they do the, uh, the STM, SCS in, the, in a UHV system. And that's what's going to happen for, or we'll have those capabilities here as well in situ to, for 2DCC, for the MBE grown materials, uh, it actually will never have to leave vacuum. It can be transferred directly over to a full probe um, STM system. Okay, so there's nothing else online, it looks like. Uh, we're going to wait here for, I think there's a couple questions coming in online, so. Yeah. So, you mentioned uh, one of those graphs so the question is about using um, techniques such as focus to ion beam. I'm going to repeat it um, for uh, for sample processing or sample preparation for these different systems. And yeah, for the TEM for transmission electron microscopy, quite often it's done using the FIB. So you basically you come in, you slice it, um, and then what you do is you pull it out. It, it gets thinned to um, you know, electron transparency, and then they use that slice in the TEM for doing cross-section. Now if you're just going to do something like looking at a plan view so you can take the whole film off the substrate and put it on the TEM grid, you don't need FIB for that. Um, but if you're going to do, quite often when you're going to do cross-section of these materials, um, and uh, that's when you start to need FIB. And it's the same as what happened for when we did the different orientations of the tungsten telluride, um, where you wanted to, we wanted to make sure we had the proper orientation to look at it. Okay, so we have a question on the difference between SIMS and time of flight SIMS. I think we have Jeff Schallenberger here in the audience who could probably answer that question. Right, Jeff? Yeah, there really isn't a big difference between those two techniques anymore. Um, traditionally, TOF SIMS was meant primarily as a tool to probe the outer monolayer of material, but increasingly those tools are being used to, uh, to profile, do three-dimensional profiling into material. So I, I would say there really isn't a, a difference between those now. Uh, not all dynamic sims use a time of flight detector, but the basic information that they provide is, is, is very similar. So the, the question, the, the last question here is, is about differentiating basically 2D CC from the other 2D um, uh, centers here. And 2D CC is considered a facility. So People, folks that are related to Atomic, which is another um, industry-driven um, center, as well as 2DLM, those are users that would use the facility. So in the case of people that are involved in any kind of 2D research, whether it's in Atomic or 2DLM, they would write proposals to 2DCC to be able to do research uh, in 2DCC, no different than if they were to use uh, something like the Materials Characterization Lab or the Nanofab um, in this particular case. So, so that's the primary difference in uh, the, uh, the, the, the various entities here at Penn State for 2D materials. So the, the question was, is are, what are the differences between TOF SIMS and ICP mass spec uh, sensitivity? So do you want to answer that or? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I yeah. Yeah. So, so I'll so, just repeat. Yeah. The inherent sensitivity is probably both comparable, but uh, ICP mass is a fault technique. And um, you know, with standards, is very, very quantitative. Uh, top sims, 
has uh, similar kinds of sensitivity, but uh, really just samples the outer surface and is generally not quantitative. Yeah, yeah. That answers the question. Okay. Are 2DCC proposals open to non-U.S. institutions? We can absolutely work with you on that. So um, feel free to, to uh, write write me, and then we can uh, or. Professor Redwing, um, the director, and we can certainly uh, to, to work on that. Yeah, so, um, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> but <laughs> just to follow on that, that it, it is easiest if there is a U.S. collaborator um, to, to be able to do that. Um, and any one of us are happy to be collaborators, I think. <laughs> Okay, so are there any more questions online? I think we're going to wrap up. We're right near the end of our time, so I think Suresh is typing something. Um, so let's just see what he says. Oh, thanks. Okay, great. <laughs> You're welcome. So, <laughs> uh, so if there's no more questions here at the home audience, thank you so much. Um, we do have a presentation on November 29th. It's on the 